are these people? Holy crap. This is a crazy story. All right. We started to talk about it a little bit. Like I said, we had a three minute cut on at the end of how do we miss that talking about how Stripe has, was screwing with the last American vagabond. But I don't even know if I had written this article yet. I don't. No, no, we're not cheering for that. What? <laughs> what, 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 what what are we doing there no we're not cheering for that that was bad okay <laughs> yeah no. no no it's bad so stripe has a monopoly we're not cheering for that no yay for that all right stripe screwed with the last american vagabond we're definitely not cheering for that Let, last american vagabond by the way indie media award honoree let's get that kicked off for tonight all right <clears throat> exclusive it was an exclusive article written by us and no one else had really been talking about this which is why i wrote it up and i couldn't believe a big vulnerability for substack and creators is stripe what the hell more creators are having issues with stripe with sub with substacks exclusive payment processor stripe but they're not just exclusive for substack they're exclusive for locals they're exclusive for buy me a coffee a lot of our favorite content creators actually do rely on Stripe quite a bit for mo for payouts for credit card processing. So <clears throat> I start this out that as a platform that advertises free speech and a censorship free environment, as long as you adhere to their minimal T's and C's, and they won't even censor people when they got accused of platforming Nazis. And we're going to talk about that at the end of the, sh uh, of, of the article. Substack is hiding a dirty little secret. All right, that the company is stealthily outsourcing the potential for censorship to its exclusive payment provider, Stripe. Wait, yes, they've been alerted to this and strangely have been silent, at least publicly. Alarmingly, Stripe... Keep it secret. Keep it secret. All right, alarmingly, Stripe has the control and power to indiscriminately close out one's account without further appeal, conversation, or discussion thereby eliminating a creator's ability to monetize on Substack and multiple other websites. That's a few of them. Apparently now Spotify uses them to pay out as well. Now, Kofi is not exclusive, so you can get a payout through PayPal if you're allowed to monetize through PayPal. Now, Ryan, is the last American vagabond, has already been kicked off of PayPal. So I did a little, we did this little three-minute video where we talked about this and, and about the problem. So... That was last Sunday night. Monday, I got so mad that I started writing an article. And it I think I published it on like Wednesday or Thursday, or I'd done it the week before. Okay, bye, Reef. Uh <laughs> dog dog will yell at me if I don't let dog in. Ah, doggo. Okay, that's a that's a dog call. So here's what happened with the last American Vagabond. Um Stripe demonetized and now told them. On May 27th, on Memorial Day, they, he published, you know, Ryan puts out on his Twitter, I need help because here's another act of financial censorship carried out today by Stripe. Since they updated their terms of service in April, they suddenly claim I'm in violation. We provide a clear service, yet they claim we're crowdfunding and we are a crowdfunder. That's crazy, right? And that starting mm -hmm. June 10th, Sunday, June 10th, he would no longer be able to monetize. Now, at the time, there had been zero appeal to his knowledge. He had requested an appeal twice and had been denied. I found out later on. I actually, you know, had a back and forth with him after all of this. This was, again, in early June. I published this June 4th. But, okay. but, I, but I also put out on Substack notes, hey, are there any other people that are having problems with this? So first we find out that a, a Canadian guy comes back and says, Pundit Man says, he was required to provide verification requirements, and he's an Anon, and he's like, what, wh why do I have to provide, like, personal identity requirements to get paid by Stripe? Like, they're processing my credit cards. This is weird, All right? Mm -hmm. So we're writing to let you know that we're updating the verification requirements for Canada-based Stripe accounts. As a result, your, your account has outstanding requirements, and you... Uh, requirements do and you need a user with verified id to some to sign in and complete it it, it was what the rest of it said i, I don't see. know if that's a i don't know if that's a canadian government thing i don't know if that's a regulation thing i don't know what the hell that is all right 
We've got Stripe yeah. rejecting some creator subscribers who are trying to upgrade their subscription. Now, I found out after the fact, and I'm glad I get to have this conversation and slow down for a second, because it turns out that this was more a error on Substack side. Because this creator has been working very closely with Stripe. And they're like, honestly, Stripe has been really helpful. And what they're telling me is that I've got subscribers that are trying to upgrade and somehow there's something wrong when um you know when they're trying to 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 do their upgrade something isn't connecting and that's actually happening from the Substack API and I've got receipts like wow okay but in the beginning he thought that somebody was pulling his chain and that that it was a problem with Stripe and again it just seems to be that the problems are happening with Stripe but on top of that right. I got a lot more I got Another guy from another country that will that shall not be named because to keep him anonymous and protect his identity said that Stripe monetization isn't even available to all creators as many countries like the one that I live in are ineligible from another creator. Okay, Stripe doesn't allow payments to my country and most of the world, so there was discrimination from the beginning. Basically, writers from rich Western countries and their allies get paid, and those from poorer countries don't. The G7 is intending to sanction countries using Russia's alternative to Stripe. And if this is true, then should there should be an alternative to offered in these countries, right? Like you that think. just seems that just seems to make sense financially, right? Mm -hmm. Right? So Stripe has canceled accounts that they don't consider to be active enough, asked Liz Burton. Now, again, on top of this, Liz Burton reached out and was like, yeah, that's not exactly what happened. I know I said that, but there was more to it. That was a work account. We weren't using it. The business closed. Like, okay. But she was getting paid out through, uh, through Square and did okay with Square. And that was the point of... Hearing that, like, I haven't heard of any of them stri Stripe canceling any Substack accounts because of a lack of activity. I will say that here on stream. Coming, Coming to, to a, a Substack, Substack newsletter, newsletter near you. you. Oh, with the echo. Ooh. I got, I got, I got echo. double, I got double mad, mad cow. Um, I don't know how that worked out. I don't know, but don't do that oh. again. Um, <laughs> Stripes. So here, our friend Karina Maltesta, she she runs a, a phenomenal newsletter, and I won't say the word because I don't want to trigger him. Um, but she runs a great <laughs> newsletter. She does an international news roundup. She's very focused on the updates on Palestine and covering Al Mayadeen and other sources. So Karina read what I was saying, and I was starting to warn people back, you know, at the end of May, and on notes and tagging people and asking. The founders, what's going on here? She says, "Nope, yeah. I'm never, I'm never going to join Stripe. That's all I needed to know. USA means Israeli surveillance, just like Twitter with authentics and I, a AU one zero TIX. If you haven't looked into it, the Gray Zone's done some phenomenal work about the uh, company that the that Twitter has or whatever Elon Musk and." And his WEF puppet CEO have decided to hire for their verification process is a unit right. 8200 Mossad out, outfit um, called Authentic. But anyway, Karina says that after Authentic. reading Authentics, so, uh, Karina says after reading this, then I'm never going to join Stripe. <clears throat> I'm never giving those lunatics my personal information. So I actually had tagged the CEO of Stripe. Who's on here? Patrick something. But here's one that, that really was holy shit. And I got even more craziness. I said, as I was writing this article, I got tagged in another note about a similar issue that Live Without Limits with Klaus is experiencing. He's obviously over in Europe. All right. More than 60% of his Stripe transactions are failing, which means that he's got people that sign up. And for whatever reason, it then says that their credit card didn't process and cancels their subscription. What a pain in the ass. Now they need to go and resubscribe. Somebody needs to tell them this happened. They need to go and resubscribe and, and fix whatever this is. And a lot of the subscribers just aren't going to do that. <laughs> Whose job is it to track down all those subscribers? Because 
Stripe's email, if the subscriber even sees it, isn't working, obviously. Klaus is really freaking out about this, and I can understand. Yeah. But this one, holy shit. All right. This one's unreal. So what the word herder just found out is that I went to go undo my connection to Stripe and found out that if I stop using it, they want me to refund all the money that ever went through them back to them so they can <laughs> refund it to my readers and probably keeping their cut. The money is there. All right. When I click the button for assistance, nothing happened. Odd, huh? These people lied to me when I turned it on, saying I wouldn't have to have a second verification for a while, but BS, grr. Yeah. So we're seeing a, a pattern here, and, and it all leads back to one choke point, which is Stripe. Oh, but I got more. A lot of Jimmy Dore fans are, would be familiar with Robert Malone, also people who have been following the COVID stuff, because... Yep. He he proclaims himself to be the father of the mRNA vaccine that is alleged and disputed in a lot of circles, but I don't care either way. But what I do care about is that Stripe came to him and asked for additional financial verification about where his money was coming from. What? Excuse me? Like, what? You're a fucking payment processor. Why are you getting involved? All right. To Where's the, point, the money, Lebowski? To the point where he had to crowdfund um uh oh why am i getting late all right where he had to crowdfund oh no 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 buffering no no buffering we're good <clears throat> all right robert malone ended up having to crowdfund legal fees and he sued stripe for this and he won yep. and they they ended up backing down and not requiring whatever financial info they were they were asking for that he never provided and continue to process his payments and have his account in good standing. <clears throat> um, that was, they demanded financial details from authors and he wrote that. I don't know if anybody else that got it. Uh, I know that he did. And then our friend Samara, who got a shout out on hard lens media. I thought that was really cool of kit. Um, shout out, uh, you know, Samara runs Liberty magazine. He started that right about like November. And he tried to build out like a a multi-writer outlet, not just one, kind of like what we do at INN Stack. Um, and he got screwed with by Stripe too. They effectively froze their, in his accounts. And then later on, he was like, fuck you, you know, Stripe, you've completely destroyed our ability to monetize. Now they're working on multiple different ways for Liberty Magazine to, to raise money. Um, so... It's it's been it's been a mess, right? But all right, so I bring all these receipts, right? And Stripe is the problem. But I've been in business a long time, and I know that first of all, you need alternatives, and the big thing is diversity. But all right, don't just bring me problems, bring me solutions. And that's what my bosses have always told me. And the ones, and this is, you know, the, the better employees actually don't just complain, they actually have answers on what to do about it, or at least choices on what to do about it. And guess what? One of those things, one of those choices will actually probably be picked or, or not, but at least bring them. So I acknowledge that adding more providers adds a layer of complexity to both finance and IT and to ensure that all of the, but, you know, to all, they got to ensure that all these API fields API is just a big database effectively. And what you need to do is map your API, your database, to the database on the other side so that you don't have to download a massive amount of, of data on a daily basis. I'm just giving you a little inside baseball about how data works. The API is like, is like the advanced form of a database where I know exactly where that data that I'm going to need in, in the other, on the other guy's thing is going to sit. I'm just going to ping just that field rather than download the whole database so I can get that field. I'm only going to ping it right out of your database, bing. And that's what's going on. And Stripe has an API, and Substack has an API, and other payment processors have APIs. And if you just plug them all into Substacks, guess what? The customer is going to get, you know, the, the, the reader is going to get the same experience, and the writer will get the same experience. Substack will have to deal with a couple of different companies on how to arrange those plugins. But once that's made, 
it basically runs on its own and it gives people choice. All right, so it's critical that the readers and subscribers, like I said, have a consistent experience irrespective of a payment processor, but this should not be that hard. If Buy Me A Coffee has already figured it out, if there are other platforms that have already figured this out, there really is no reason to find other ones and to offer choice. So the first one that I think may not be the greatest um, choice in the end, but Square slash Block could appear to be a potential alternative. They're as big as Stripe, or almost. They're a publicly traded global organization with an API and a direct competitor. Now, I found out afterwards that they had, that they did some COVID censorship. Allegedly, I don't, I did not look deep into that. I still need to look deeper into it. All right, but, mm. um, you know, the, their hate speech and how that can be manipulated. And I'm also reading that they also charge among the highest fees in the industry, which of course is not going to be what Substack wants, but with the size that Substack has, they could probably negotiate a pretty good deal with Square for the kind of volume they're going to provide. Right. But Square also offers a lot of things that, that Substack would not really take advantage of. Now, this one I thought was really interesting and that's called global payments. By the way, in the article, I link to all these different things. I provide receipts to all this. So everybody who wants to go digging can feel free to, because I did. So, Global payments, and I don't know where they're based out of. That could be the company that's out of Russia that that Mike is talking about. I don't, I don't know. Um, but global payments appears to be a potential suitor. They can handle the processing worldwide. They handle most major credit cards in most countries, which would empower Substack to expand its monetization footprint to those countries. But they also, I found out, deal in crypto. So not only could you monetize in multiple countries where you're not, you're, uh, there are a handful of creators that are asking to be able to be paid in crypto. Be connected! Okay, I'm not saying that Substack needs to be involved in crypto, although <laughs> can't you see the stack token working? I mean, come on. Anyway, I'm just joking. I'm not a crypto fan, but... If there are creators that do want to transact in that, why are we restricting their ability to do so? Here's the third one. It's called Clearly Payments. Now, I don't know about their scalability, although right there it says scalable and secure solutions for online payments. So that tells me they can handle what, what they're looking for. So that was just a, like a rudimentary search, right? Mm -hmm. And I address PayPal. While it appears that PayPal may present itself as an alternative, we know through Richard Medhurst, through The Last American Vagabond, Whitney Webb, and many others, they have been heavy on the censorship. They've been known to censor a mess with payments that even mention the word Palestine or Syria, for example. And our friend Samara tells me that that on the right, that, they're been, that they've been doing the same thing, you know, Liberty Magazine. I don't know if they personally have been censored, but people he knows have been. Um. Mm -hmm. So another way to find an alternative potentially rather than just doing a Google search like I did for 45 minutes and just looking at the problem is to reverse engineer the whole thing and announce that you're putting this, this contract out for bid that anyone who wants to potentially connect to the Substack API and process payments for Substack creators. Hey, um, let's, let's talk about it. Let's bid on it. Let's have you, you know, kind of, Show us what you got. Tell us how much you charge. And if we can plug in and offer that as a choice, we would be happy to do so. Right? Right. So that's reversing it. And then Michael Ginsburg says to that it's time to bring the entire payment processing operation in-house. All right? That you guys are getting big enough at this point. You've got enough creators. You've promised enough. You cannot put this at risk to a third-party company. And I kind of agree with him too, but I know for a fact that um, it's a beast and you've got all kinds of financial regulations and they don't want to deal with processing the money. They want to outsource that so they can focus on making a better platform. I get that. But you got to take care of your creators and they're not doing it. 
So clearly there are alternatives out there, and that only required just 45 minutes of research to find those couple. But I also wanted to look into a little bit deeper. Why is this happening now? So I'm going to speculate, but we covered the censorship industrial complex quite a bit. And we actually, there was an update on that this week. We're going to probably cover next week. Um, but we just saw through Matt Taibbi's articles published to Racket News just at the end of May that the same academics who were effective in pushing Twitter to, to censor creators that they deemed to be foreign influence, quote unquote, based on flimsy uh -huh. or no evidence, all right, are at it again for the 2024 cycle, looking to do it bigger and better than before, quote unquote. Most of the people who are having issues are those that challenge and question the mainstream narrative on those things like COVID, Russia, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, Taiwan, China, and plenty of other things, right? So that tells yep. me that, you know, what's happened? Why is this happening? Well, censorship ramping up. People are getting squeezed. Is somebody at the payment processor saying to mess with these specific? I don't know. Is somebody reporting these people? I don't know. But it's also an election year, so C number one, right? But I thought that this was a big thing, and a lot of people kind of forgot about it. But back in December, we covered an article. We covered not just an article, but a series of articles, an entire uproar that was happening on that platform itself that was driven by the Atlantic magazine. And one of the people who has a substack but has since left may, you know, kind of mm. did one of the Remember, You know how people like leave Twitter in a huff? I'm leaving and I'm a bit, and you guys are platforming Nazis and dead of a bit. And that was basically what he did. But not only that, I challenge the, the owners of Substack to make changes to your platformer. We're leaving. And they basically Fuck gave... This shit, I'm out. Oh, that's a good one. But yes, that's that's effectively what they did. And they ended up <laughs> and they ended up having to move. All right. They ended up having to leave right. Substack for the most part. I mean, they're still there to annoy people and to lurk and to spy on everybody. But Look, this guy works for the fucking Atlantic magazine. That's that's Lauren Jobs. That's as neolib as it gets. Fuck those guys. So but, fuck you. Right? So this became like an entire movement of shit libs that showed up and were trying to scream at Substack to make changes to the platform. <laughs> yeah, no. So, but here's what happened. They didn't really go away. They just chipped away at the biggest vulnerability they saw, which is Stripe. That group's ultimate goal is to diminish Stripe's increasing footprint in the publishing space. Like I said, Jonathan Katz, one of the principals of that movement, published multiple hit pieces in The Atlantic, smearing the platform and ridiculously claiming that it had a Nazi problem. Uh-huh. That was quickly debunked, and they left after a censor or else demand was not acquiesced to. In hindsight, it appears to have been a corporate-funded and corporate media-driven effort to diminish Substack's growing power coming directly at the expense of corporate media. I mean, we're taking readers directly away from them, right? Every day. Yep. And it's flipping them out, especially the Atlantic magazine. I mean, they've been like, you know, king of the shit lib world forever at this at this point. So these people, you know, the the, the Substackers against Nazis, there was this woman named Mar Marissa Cabis, or Melissa or Marissa Cabis. Um, this guy from Garbage Day, there was about a half a dozen of them who then picked up their ball and, and left. Mm -hmm. Bear. Um, so they wanted to punish Stripe for ignoring their demand to censor the creators that they didn't like, forcing their hand um, to have to uh, for the inconvenience of moving their newsletters and subscribers. So they sought and found a back door and this is not the chicka chicka bow wow. I was literally just saying, like, literally, I'm out the I'm out the back door. All right, but um, sorry, children. Thank you. Uh, they knew that Stripe was the exclusive processor for Substack's monetization, but also for locals and buy me a coffee. So they started reporting creators to Stripe quietly, whom they deemed to be not worthy of monetizing, charging them with violating Stripe's TOS. That likely are the creators, you know, that cats thought were Nazis. But 
it very quickly devolved into, well, these people are anti-trans and these people are platforming this and that. And it became like a censorship realm. You know, they, they were all begging for it about multiple things. And it was like, these people are injuring me. You have to ban them. No, it immediately devolved. It was like within weeks. And we called it that that was what they were trying to do, that it, was, it didn't just stop at the 16 or 26 or whatever accounts this guy deemed to have Nazi content that he claimed that Substack was profiting from. As if they built their mm. entire structure to profit from those dozens of... And we cover this extensively. So, but you I believe... But I honestly believe that, that these people either created a bot to report these creators or they did it themselves because there weren't that many of them. But right. beyond that, I got more. <clears throat> the people reporting them to Stripe for TOS violations knew that they personally wouldn't be affected since any move that by any move Substack made, all right, or that Stripe made because those creators had already moved to other platforms like Beehive. <laughs> now, this is another part of the thing. I think that part of this was whoever is involved with Beehive, their model is that they pay creators, especially large ones, for bringing your audience over and then referring them to other Beehive newsletters. Now, we don't get paid at Substack for referring other newsletters. It's just like a community thing. But these guys are literally monetizing their database and their subscriber list to refer them to other, you know, uh, newsletters that, um, that they may like or not like. And anyone who signs up, that original creator gets paid. We don't get paid for referring stuff. And I just think that's kind of dirty. Was that another reason that was behind this? We were already going to move, and this is another way to take more people out at Substack. I, I don't know. This was episode 103. We recorded it back in December. If you want to watch, it was a fascinating episode. Um, I went through a bunch of people's notes about it. I went through a couple of articles, through the petition itself, through a counter petition. There was an entire thing that went back and forth for like a month. A on counter, this. counter petition. Um, so, I talked about how Stripe was screwing over all these creators. So, I'm sitting at the Do Dissidents live show on sun last Sunday afternoon. By the way, that's why we didn't do a show last Sunday. Um, but last Sunday afternoon, we're sitting at Do Dissidents live. I'm watching Jesse do a rehearsal, and I get a DM from the Last American Vagabond saying that, oh, hey, yes, those guys. Uh, I don't know if they're still live, but they were live earlier, I know. Uh, shout out to those guys. But they they did a really good show, and I appreciate them giving Jesse the platform. Um, I ended up filming, and I was the camera guy. That's a whole other story. You can watch me tell the story on uh, with Tara or this week. I was Tara's guest or with Hardlands. I told it a little bit there, too. But um, Stripe reinstates the last American Vagabond. Ah, so I get a message from Ryan. At the last American talk about, hey, I don't know if your article had anything to do with it. It may have put us over the top, but I just got an email from Stripe saying they have re they've rescinded the block and and the cancellation, and I'll be able to monetize going forward. I was like, fuck yes, dudes, that's great. So awesome. Okay, great. So that was what happened. Fantastic news. Like I said, we found out yesterday morning that Stripe has reversed their decision to terminate T Labs account. And they'll be allowed to continue in good standing. As you should. Tribute to our friend Kit. So I wanted to personally say thank you to everyone who shared and made noise. I wrote a, a follow-up article about this the morning after the Jesse show. That was last Monday. Um, thank you to everyone who shared and made noise about the prior article published here about what happened to TLAV and about the danger of Stripe's monopoly over Substack and the other content creation sites. Um, yeah. Now... I didn't include it here. Well, I'm not going to show it here, but go to this article and it'll be in the description afterwards. But watch the above 10 and a half minute video clipped from that T Lab stream on Sunday. He was really not, you know, very. Who are these people? Who are these people? Oh, yay. We got it. We got a donation. Yay. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. But thank you. We, I'll put that up afterwards. But we'll, we'll, we found out that 
Um, so I, again, I want to say thank you to everyone who shared and made noise about this article. Uh, I was so excited to hear about this. And he did a, you know, like a little segment in his stream. By the way, he, he Lab does a stream just about every day of the week. He does a daily wrap up and sometimes it can go for hours. He goes really deep into a lot of topics that are very controversial. And he seems to be way ahead of everybody else. Sometimes he's wrong. Most of the time he's not. And I really appreciate him putting himself out there on a limb and taking a shot each time. Um, and again, usually he's right. Now, to me, there are not very many places that Whitney Webb chooses to publish. And choosing to publish a T-Lev means a lot to me. So when I saw this was happening to Ryan, for Whitney alone, not only for all the other reasons, but for the fact that he's been so good to Whitney, there was no doubt that I was going to step up and help him, whether he asked me or not. And he never really did. This was not something that, other than the public call to ha say, hey, can you help? Ryan never asked me to write an article. Ryan never gave me any of that stuff. And uh, to his credit, he, it, you know, I don't blame him for, you know, or fault him for that. I wouldn't blame him for not asking anyone. You know, he was going to deal with it however he was going to deal with it. But I saw this as, a community thing. This affects us all, not just Ryan. This could be me. This could be Hardlands. This could be RBN. This could be any one of us. We all say mm. shit that pushes the envelope. And I hate to see that happen. And I'm on a platform that uses this exclusively. I've been watching this happen. I've seen it happen to other people. I'm like, you know, look, uh, if anyone's going to say something, I guess it's going to have to be me. But this is what's really interesting is that Ryan also during his his stream identified that Substack made a change again to their terms of service effective early June that would exempt his channel and others as content creators by further clearly defining what a content creator is. But then opens up further questions about crowdfunding sites that Stripe has no affiliation with because they only really want to allow you to monetize with Stripe with, with sites that Stripe has approved, apparently. All right. But they also have other loopholes that would allow them to still terminate a content creator's account. And mm -hmm. they added a lot of language defining what they determined to be a content creator. Is that a good thing? I'm not sure. Did this language appear because of what we're doing here? I don't know. I hope so. My feeling is, is that they've been doing this since April. So at first they put out a broad general thing. Then they see what happens. A couple of people cry. Then they put out a, a tweak to it. Then t -Lab gets caught in that net. Then we start making noise. I tag the CEO. I tag the people at Substack. And somebody says something to somebody along the way there. It, again, it, it's a collective effort. Um, Ryan also went on. He goes on AM Wake Up every week. He's on t -Lab Tuesday. He was talking about it with Steve Poikin in this past Tuesday as well. And Steve and Ryan also gave, gave me a nice shout out. I was in chat there putting it up like I couldn't believe it. And again, this was, this was about all of us. This was not just about me. This was not about Ryan. This was about making sure that Stripe is not messing around with creators and that we're going to fight back together. And, and that, kumbaya, my lord. Okay. We've got all of our wonderful supporters Support independent media, like I say all the time, because it's more important than ever. Because where else are you getting that story? You get a service. You you get product for this. It's not a donation. It's not a, a crowdfunding. And we have to be careful now about how we say this. But we have supporters who appreciate the content that we provide on an ongoing daily, weekly basis. And we love you for it. Thank you so much. I love you all. Support independent media because we need it more than ever. Thank you, and I'll see you. We'll see you next week. Yeah, bye, fam. Keep us up. What little person to tell you? Seeing you a bit. No, we just fucking lost the stream.